you. Let me get started. Uh, so, this, I suppose it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, talking to Dr. Philip and coming back to the conference after some time. So, uh, though my uh, work primarily has been on AI and related uh, deep learning and related stuff in the last year or so, this topic is of interest for me because uh, this is of uh, great interest in my heart. I did my PhD in distributed systems. So, it's a pleasure to look at distributed systems and look at some of the issues that were there. So, the inspiration of course came from the fact that Google uh, you know, came up with their spanner and it was uh, made available in the cloud recently. So, just wanted to look at that space and what's happening you know, around data safety and consensus and so on. So, the, the uh, talk is a result of that. Uh, so, we'll uh, see if this works. Thank you. Yeah, so just want to uh, bring up some of the old systems which were considered uh, complex uh, systems probably about 10 15 years back, of course. But these uh, were the monolithic systems of old, and uh, people could actually statically program the behavior of the system, and uh, you know, not much of dynamicity was there. and uh, and of course, it was mostly stateless kind of systems. Uh, so, why am I bringing this up is to kind of illustrate and contrast with some uh, some of the recent systems, for example, things like TensorFlow, which can be seen as uh, really complex uh, systems, right? Complex distributed systems. Uh, so, for instance, TensorFlow, the uh, I don't know how many people are aware, but started as disbelief system about uh, four or five years back and. The disbelief paper was published by Jeffrey Dean and his uh, folks at Google Brain. It became a bit of a rage at that time because that was the first time people were talking about distributed deep learning and it became a, a you know, good, good piece of work. So, people started looking at it. One of the key things was uh, it had a parameter server which was kind of centralized. There used to be worker nodes on each node which used to connect to the parameter server stateless worker nodes connecting to a parameter server which had all the state and all of them running certain computations for example, a deep learning uh, computation or any of that. Uh, so, that is how it started. So, this uh, was the precursor to TensorFlow. So, TensorFlow is uh, the next level of uh, system compared to disbelief and so on, but what is different about it? So, it is of course, a data flow system. So, you have a huge number of data flow systems uh, currently on. Uh, so, for example, the uh, Microsoft had a link you know, which was a uh, one of the older data flow systems. Amazon has MXNet, Facebook has Cafe. So, I mean, what is really different about uh, TensorFlow? Uh, one of the key things is uh, the fact that there are two things which, uh, of course, are uh, important to note here. So, one is that uh, the uh, so, once a uh, TensorFlow graph is built, you know, for example, by the user, then the system kind of prunes and figures out what subgraph to do and you know certain computations to be uh, done on subgraphs. So, that becomes uh, you know one thing that is doable is concurrently executing multiple uh, you know, parts of the subgraph and doing computations on the subgraphs. That is one unique part of it. Second is of course, the fact that uh, uh, in a, uh, most of these uh, data flow systems tend to run as uh, for example, there is a set of vertices and edges connecting them up. Edges typically are used for uh, flow of data, right? That is why they are called data flow systems and vertices are typically ones which do certain computations on the data which flows in. Uh, traditionally, data flow systems have always been uh, uh, 
doing computations on immutable data. So, the computations do not modify data that is there on the that flows into the vertices. TensorFlow allows mutable data that is a significant difference because what happens is now the vertices can actually modify the data and so what does it mean for us? So, one of the key things is then the shared state has to be managed. So, one thing is uh, it kind of merges state management right with the TensorFlow graph execution. So, that is one point we need to keep in mind and of course, there are uh, the complexity of the system arises due to various factors including the fact that uh, it is distributed, you have uh, you know the uh, distributed master which prunes the graph and partitions the graph and uh, distributes it to different uh, parts of the network. And you had kernel implementations which are the specific implementations. Uh, so, there are many many kernels. So, the flow the data flow has to be executed on specific kernels which the user chooses at that point of time. So, that is one uh, layer you know of complexity. Then of course, you have the different devices on which they can execute. You have the GPUs and CPUs and what not. One key thing again contrasting from its uh, predecessor which was disbelief is that TensorFlow um, works on a heterogeneous cluster of nodes. Disbelief used to work on just homogeneous nodes. So, that is one again uh, key difference. Uh, so, some of these things and we need to keep in mind that uh, TensorFlow, uh, why am I talking about all this and you know talking about TensorFlow at such level of detail is to illustrate the fact that this is one of the complex systems that am I on the mic properly? It is fine right? Okay. One of the systems which uh, are really complex distributed systems, shared state across a set of nodes need to solve distributed consensus problem. So, such systems need to solve consensus at scale that is the whole point I was trying to make. Um, so, I mean just to illustrate the problem right we go back to school pretty much and this is how uh, consensus problems are described in uh, distributed computing classes. So, I am just taking you back to school for a minute. So, bear with me, but interestingly right. So, two people who are uh, sitting in their own offices want to meet for coffee. So, uh, Bob and allies. So, the only medium of communication this is older days. So, they have only an email that can be sent. The email is sent over a medium which is unreliable. So, when Bob sends an email to Ally saying can we meet for coffee, Bob does not know that Ally has got the email right and Ally sends an acknowledgement saying yeah got it we will meet. And again Ally does not know that Bob received the acknowledgement. So, the medium is unreliable. So, that means messages could be lost, messages could be delayed, they could be delivered after it an unbounded period of time makes it very complex. So, the whole point is if it is a simple uh, of course, if, if you think of it right it looks like very trivial problem and a phone call will solve it and because the other person knows that you know if I say you know can we meet for coffee and she says yes and because I know she heard me and so that kind of assumes that the act here the issue is because of the medium is unreliable, you are not sure if the acknowledgement reached the other person. So, just before stepping out right, again Bob thinks did uh, Alice receive my acknowledgement and if he thinks oh if she does not see the acknowledgement then she may not come and again he sends another acknowledgement and again Alice thinks the same thing if he does not see this acknowledgement then he may not come. So, it goes on. So, the whole idea is that why I am trying to say is that in an purely asynchronous distributed system which in which the medium of communication which is the network is unreliable, consensus cannot be achieved. So, this is the famous Fisher, Lynch and Peterson's theorem which says or, or the impossibility result as it is called which says that in a purely asynchronous distributed system consensus is impossible to achieve. So, I mean this looks like a dead end right I mean consensus cannot be achieved. So, what should we do? However, it turns out that under certain conditions right where from a purely asynchronous system becomes slightly synchronous and you know from a completely unreliable medium network becomes slightly reliable. So, then conditions arise under which consensus is achievable, but this is the broader perspective of the problem. Uh, so, these are the conditions right. For example, the uh, 
so one uh, point which we can uh, look at is so this is a table which tells under what conditions consensus can be achieved in a distributed system. So uh, different things are there. So the way to read it is processes can be synchronous or uh, asynchronous. So that's one part. So asynchronous processors, uh, synchronous processors means that uh, when one processor takes say n steps, then it's guaranteed that all the others take at least one step. So that's what is typically called as synchronous processors. Uh, if, if it's a synchronous case, obviously uh, there's no step, so the process need not take any steps, so there's no movement or liveness is not guaranteed. That's an asynchronous system. Um, let's say delivery could be unbounded or bounded. That means that there is a time uh, within which message delivery will be delivered, message will be delivered. If it is unbounded, there is no timeout, so timeouts cannot be used. That is one uh, other uh, aspect of it here. So the message delivery is unbounded or bounded. Then of course you have the communication medium, whether it is broadcast or point to point. Uh, so if you see it, right, in an asynchronous system, right, and this is almost always not achievable. The only exception is here you see which is that, uh, of course, the other aspect is messages could be ordered or unordered. So, in that case, uh, for example, you have an ordered broadcast. So, this seems like a bit of a, you know, how, this, how is it possible to implement an ordered broadcast primitive, right, in a purely distributed system. Uh, so, it turns out that case kind of covers systems which are not really distributed. For example, the parallel architectures and things like that, right, which, in which case, processors may share a common bus. So, if the bus is shared, then it is likely that they would be able to implement a broadcast primitive, which is an ordered broadcast. If an ordered broadcast is uh, uh, solvable, then this is also solvable. So, they can uh, be uh, treated as uh, problems which can be uh, uh, which is equivalent in the sense that one can be used to solve the other and so on. Uh, so, that is uh, this case, you know, right? That uh, uh, So, it, in an asynchronous system, only in this case, when it is an ordered broadcast, consensus is achievable. In all the other cases, consensus is uh, not doable if this uh, process are asynchronous. Uh, the interesting cases here are probably about two or three things which we can look at. And of course, there are certain conditions which uh, you know, or properties of consensus which are there, so which are given here, so consistency has to be there. That means that the uh, input values, um, so all agents will agree on the same value, right? And it is uh, a value which one of the agents is actually inputting, that is the condition of validity. Eventually, the protocol should terminate. That's a termination condition. All these these conditions must be met for any uh, consensus protocol. Uh, and of course, the uh, key thing is uh, here: if uh, processors are uh, synchronous, right, and message delivery is bounded, right, consensus is always achievable. So, what should the system do in this case to achieve consensus? So, use timeouts because you have a bound within which messages should be delivered. For example, I'll say twice that. Uh, bound will be a timeout, and if something is not delivered by the time, then I can safely assume that because the network guarantees it's going to be delivered within that time, then I could safely assume that the uh, processor is down. The key thing in most cases is we are not able to distinguish when a processor is down from it's not able to receive the messages. So there is a problem in the network versus the processor is failing. So that distinction if we are not able to make, and that's why consensus is not achievable. But uh, if the process synchronous and message delivery is bounded, you are able to do that. Similarly, right, the, uh, uh, the, the other case when it is achievable is uh, again, uh, uh, for example, when uh, we saw the other one, right, which is the, when you have an atomic broadcast, this is doable. The last case is, uh, you know, when uh, process is synchronous, message delivery is unbounded, but messages are ordered. But it turns out that in this case, right, it is a, uh, the, the, the protocol is actually so lengthy that it's not of practical use. So uh, essentially, right, that there are mostly two conditions under which consensus is doable. So of course, one is the ordered broadcast kind of thing. The other is, of course, when processes are synchronous and message delivery is bounded. Then you know for sure you can use a timeout and achieve uh, consensus. Um, let's move on. So just to recap, right, we of course saw the properties of consensus and the Fisher-Lynch-Peterson impossibility result which said, right, uh, it's not doable in a purely asynchronous system, but this is not achievable. Uh, and of course, the uh, three cases are also given here. Uh, 
and of course shared memory kind of uh, can be seen as uh, because everybody can read each other's uh, messages right so in that case is consensus easier or not so that question does arise uh, but it turns out that uh, uh, it's not so trivial that even in a shared memory case uh, with reads and writes it's again uh, pretty difficult to achieve consensus so you need what are called as primitives for example you have a, a fetch and lock and you know fetch and add and uh, so on so there are a lot of primitives uh, which help you to achieve consensus even in a shared memory system and those primitives tend to have consensus numbers so which means that the consensus number of n means that consensus can be achieved even with n minus 1 failures so key thing is to understand that uh, consensus in the presence of failures is what makes it pretty hard and of course the other uh, thing we can uh, 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 remember is that uh, so far i have been talking about consensus is mostly what's called as uh, uh, the non byzantine consensus so which means that the uh, or or what's called as fail stop failure so processes just fail by stopping there is nothing else malicious the process is going to do but in the case of byzantine consensus which is a much harder problem processes can actually uh, act maliciously so in the sense that processes uh, send uh, wrong messages to no other nodes it could send you know one message to one node and send a different message to a different node so in all of those cases it becomes very difficult to achieve consensus so it's been proven that uh, for example in the case of game we just extend our uh, you know the bob and uh, alice uh, uh, parable to three and join all three of them want to meet for uh, coffee and it turns out that uh, again if the medium of communication of a conference call would solve the problem right you just get on conference call and say we'll meet all of them hear what you're saying they acknowledge and then you meet but if the conference call is not there which is equivalent to a broadcast kind of mechanism right uh, order broadcast kind of mechanism so in that case you know, this is doable but it turns out that you have only point to point communication right there's no broadcast like you know you can talk to only one other person on phone and then in that case how is this is doable so it turns out that in this case um, uh so even if one process can, uh, or, or one person can be malicious in sense that for example joan decides to tell bob that i will come and tell salais he won't come right in that case right it's impossible for three people to actually achieve consensus so this is what was uh, uh, you know a general problem called the byzantine generals problem and uh, where of course the uh, problem was that uh, you know, the, there are generals uh, you know in a uh, war and trying to attack Uh, camp and it, some of the generals are uh, you know uh, malicious and they tend to uh, bring down the protocol so that's the general result which is that you need uh, uh, 3n uh, processors and uh, so you, you you won't be able to achieve consensus even if uh, one third of the processors are uh, malicious that's the result um, so so there are uh, like, like we said right uh, certain conditions under which consensus is doable Uh, but how are consensus protocols implemented right so there are ways of implementing consensus protocols of course under certain assumptions so uh, so paxos is one of the common uh, uh, protocols which achieve uh, or which implement consensus uh, so one thing is uh, uh, so paxos was proposed by leslie lamport so a lot of work here i tend to refer to lamport's papers and you know his work he's been a seminal contributor to a lot of work in the space so he wrote a paper called the part time parliament so uh, this paper uh, kind of describes the problem in a rather abstract way you know talks about a, a remote island in greece called paxos uh, which uh, in which uh, people right contribute as legislators but the problem is uh, the people are all busy right so they tend to do their own businesses but go to the parliament only when they can and come out whenever they have business they come out but when they are in parliament they tend to transact some business but the key thing is uh, this model is a distributed system because uh, nodes can fail right that means coming out of the network or coming out of the parliament you know the mimics a real uh, distributed system so he modeled the whole paradigm around this problem of uh, the parliament of uh, paxos achieving or you know, tabling any useful uh, uh, info and so on right so that is how the whole paper was written but it, it turned out that uh, 
uh, it was not well received and for whatever reasons but it's actually a beautifully written paper if uh, people have time please read it's called part time parliament it's a, a wonderful paper but essentially right it, it talks about the paxos protocol right which was the first time the paxos was uh, uh, presented but the point here is uh, uh, paxos is actually very complicated protocol so there were several attempts made to simplify paxos then uh, fast paxos and so on right and uh, uh, many current distributed systems including zookeeper of the world use some variation of paxos or the other we have many no sql distribute or uh, 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 many no sql systems implementing variations of paxos one variation or the other of paxos so it is a very very common uh, protocol uh, please keep that in mind so the protocol works something like this so you have a set of proposers proposers tend to say uh, this is the value i am proposing do you agree and send it out to what are called as acceptors which uh, again you have a set of acceptors and acceptors tend to make local decisions of their own they don't need to depend on there's no global uh, decision uh, maker but every acceptor makes his own local decision so there's a proposal number each proposal sends out the number is kind of assumed to be monotonically increasing there's a ways there is ways to achieve that but yeah so given that proposals send out those uh, uh, proposals acceptors tend to look at you know whatever they are getting and don't accept proposals which come later with a lower uh, proposal number so that way right tends to be progressive and uh, they send the, the uh, acceptors send acceptances back and uh, also send the uh, acceptance back to the uh, you know who are called as readers so the readers finally figure out that uh, uh yeah the uh, all uh, or, or a majority of acceptors have accepted a certain proposal number which finally becomes the value that the system uh, accepts or or what's called as learners so uh, so that's how the paxos uh, generally works so uh, this is commonly used protocol for achieving uh, consensus uh, and of course the other is what's called as failure detectors failure detectors is uh, uh, again a different way of uh, solving the consensus problem um uh, again right if you uh, note very carefully right a perfect failure detector is one which in which every failed processor uh, is suspected of you know uh, having been failed or being detected by every other processor and uh, uh, uh so uh, again it turns out that due to the impossibility result we will see that a uh, failure detector can uh, a perfect failure detector can never be uh, live and accurate can only be one of the two things because if it were both then it would kind of violate the possibility result of special engine uh, peterson so there are different kinds of uh, affiliate detectors and uh, so based on two things one is the completeness and accuracy of uh, so completeness relates to how many of the processors which have failed are actually suspected right by uh, others and accuracy relates to being able to uh, figure out if certain processes have failed then they are suspected or if ones which have not failed or not suspected so that's the accuracy right uh, how many of them are actually uh, failing and how many of them are actually suspected so uh, the uh, uh, certain uh, systems also use variations of uh, fds and uh, implement some of these as well but of course paxos has become quite uh, more common so you you might not see implementations of the failure detectors in uh, commonly used uh, distributed systems of today Uh, so one other thing in this space which we need to keep in mind is of course the cap theorem which uh, uh, of course was uh, uh, illustrated and uh, given by uh, eric brewer first uh, so it uh, so he, what he said was essentially that uh, uh, in a partition uh, distributed system you would not be able to achieve both consistency and availability so which means that uh, uh, people tend to read it as you have three things which is partition tolerance consistency and availability you get only two of the three which uh, okay, of course could also be true but my reading of it is slightly restricted in the sense that i only look at in the phase of partitions the trade off is between consistency and availability so that's the key uh, trade off which uh, uh, the cap theorem talks about but why are we talking about the cap theorem here is uh, uh, the fact that uh, most distributed system designers have to keep uh, you know this in mind when designing the other aspect is uh, so so if you notice right the uh, typically systems are uh, known as uh, ap or cp systems 
for example, AP systems are those which uh, sacrifice consistency in the face of a partition and stick to availability. That means that they make it available for reading, but it may not be strictly consistent. So, they implement typically eventual consistency or other forms of weaker forms of consistency. Of course, the CP systems are those which uh, sacrifice availability in the face of a partition and uh, tend to keep systems consistent. Uh, so, the MongoDBs of the world would uh, appear here. So, what they would do in the face of a partition is uh, uh, some of the uh, data elements might be uh, not available for a write, but it will only be available for a read. So, that is the availability sacrifice they have to make in order to make it consistent. Right, and similarly, right, the other systems, the three uh, extremes, right, you'll have CA systems. The CA systems are the uh, traditional relational stores, which uh, uh, tend to achieve both, obviously, consistency and availability, but they don't tolerate partition. So, uh, you can't have all three, right. So, uh, of course, the, the idea is that they tend to work in a smaller cluster or typically maybe even on a single node which tends to give them the, uh, so they do not need to think about partitions, but they do not work, right. Obviously, they are not scalable horizontally and so on, right. So, they tend to be CA kind of systems. Uh, so, the point here is that the, uh, uh, while the consistency uh, available trade off is one thing, uh, practical uh, uh, distributed system designers need to keep in mind a different kind of trade off as well, which uh, people are not, uh, you know, looking at uh, that much, but which is the consistency and latency trade off. So, uh, see, the partition can be seen as a rare event, right. It is not every day we are going to have a partition of a distributed system. Partition is a worst case network failure, right, where the set of nodes are divided into two. So, the two groups cannot communicate with each other, right. That is like a extreme kind of an event. So, uh, people tend to forget that in a normal operation of a distributed system, the trade off is between consistency and latency. Because what happens is, if you want strict consistency involves, for example, protocols like Paxos or 2PC or whatever, right. So, they tend to be time consuming. So, latency, consistency is a trade off, you will have to keep in mind. The peanut system from Yahoo kind of illustrates that trade off very beautifully. So, it, what they do is, uh, they make the system available for uh, reads or what are called as stale reads. They just tend to make it available for reads irrespective of consistency. So, that is uh, uh, and they make the trade off uh, mostly irrespective of partitions. That is something you should keep in mind because most NoSQL systems tend to only talk about cap theorem and tend to say you know, we do this trade off for the cap theorem and we trade off consistency, but they are trading off consistency even in the face of a non partition event, which is actually not necessary. So, only in the case of a partition you tend to trade off consistency for availability, right. But yeah, so that is unit are not making. But then the other aspect is, uh, of course, the uh, way exactly is consensus useful. I have been talking about consensus, you know, for so long, but why is it really useful? So, I mean, it just, you know, simple things like commit protocols are based on consensus. So, people have to agree that, you know, this is a commit or this is an abort. So, it's simple things like that itself requires consensus. So, that is the reason uh, two phase commits and then there are three phase commit protocols. So, two phase commits, you know, the there are certain conditions under which two phase commits tend to fail, three phase commit protocols are proposed. So, that is one way of looking at uh, uh, transactions, right. And of course, the key thing is to be able to uh, achieve the asset properties as they are called, right. Uh, terms deconsistency, isolation, and uh, durability in uh, distributed systems tend to be hard. So, a uh, lot of distributed systems tend to trade off one over the other and uh, uh, relax consistency and so on. Primarily, for cap or uh, in certain cases it could be a latency consistency trade off as well like the peanuts uh, system. Um, so, so consistency becoming important, so asset properties are important right. So, we tend to go on to uh, the, the kind of systems which have come up of late and not uh, very recent, but last few years you see a lot of uh, what are called as new SQL systems which have come up. Uh, so, they tend to uh, be horizontally scalable and uh, be able to uh, Achieve asset properties as well in a distributed setting. Uh, so, of course, the uh, key thing is uh, to look at uh, is the kind of uh, uh, workloads that have been uh, uh, you know, coming up and especially, you know, the kind of operations that are doable, which is, you know, write intensive or read intensive. Then you have 
simple operations or complex operations, then you have the different kind of workloads, the data warehouses tend to be here, they tend to do more of reads, but the OLTP kind of tend to do more of writes to the data store. Um, so, so the whole point is uh, your traditional stores, the uh, relational stores, what are called as you know uh, GPTRs, so they tend to do some of these, so they tend to assume it's a, a, a storage is row wise. Is the time check? Only five minutes. Oh, okay. okay, so uh, tend to be uh, uh, row stores and indexing is through B3s and uh, they tend to use locking for concurrency control and uh, so they have a query optimizer which works, uh, uh, looks at uh, again row oriented uh, uh, one and they use disk uh, for storage and so on right, these are the properties but the new SQLs of the world right tend to have different kinds of properties for example as defined by Stonebreaker right that uh, they, they tend to support acid properties uh, and they use non-locking uh, concurrency control uh, protocols they tend to have uh, of course it's a shared nothing kind of architecture so uh, becomes easier to implement the same and of course high per node performance uh, they, they, they uh, tend to focus on. Um, so we will look at some of these so uh, as an example right for example one could take uh, the uh, old DB which is one of the uh, interesting new SQL stores so uh, tend to be uh, what's called a trans -silitical database so it's both analytical and transactional. So, that's the reason it's called transalytical database. So, it tends to uh, be able to scale out uh, efficiently uh, tiered data uh, stores, support streaming data. What I'm going to do is quickly skip through a couple of slides in the interest of time. So, uh, one is of course the other uh, is Clusterix, which is also an interesting uh, new, uh, new SQL store. But we'll go on to Spanner because Spanner is something of uh, interest because it's uh, recent and also from Google and the fact that they have uh, made it available on their cloud uh, tends to you know make me talk about it. So, I am just going to take 5 minutes talking about Spanner. Uh, so, uh, so one key thing in Spanner is that uh, it has what is called as a true time API. The true time API they have implemented with uh, uh, very specific hardware devices. So, they have implemented what is called as synchronized clocks. So, one of the key things which we saw right was that uh, consensus is uh, harder to achieve the clocks are not synchronized. For example, in a commit protocol, getting a timestamp, uh, global timestamp is very hard. And uh, so, that is what the uh, uh, Spanner tries to address by having uh, synchronized clocks. They do clock synchronization of course, uh, only in their data center of course, outside of that obviously, uh, Spanner cannot be used outside of the Google data center. But, um, so they, they tend to achieve uh, certain levels of reliability in the network, so they have redundant networking and so on which uh, helps them plus the fact that every uh, there are nodes in their uh, data centers which tend to be masters, time masters. So, they have Armageddon masters which maintain atomic clocks right in this system. They have GPS masters also which maintain GPS clocks. So, they have two clocks for uh, most nodes in the uh, data center and they tend to maintain time very uh, accurately. So, one key uh, reason uh, Spanner is able to do a lot of this is because uh, it is able to synchronize the clocks. Once the clocks are synchronized then it is a little easier for example, to say ok there is a timestamp and uh, the timestamp is global because nodes have synchronized clocks. The error is very very less, they uh, tend to claim it is less than 10 milliseconds. So, uh, uh, so, that is the key difference. So, one thing is which we want to uh, talk about is of course, the fact that Cockroach DB is uh, an open source implementation of uh, Google Spanner. The key difference is that uh, Cockroach DB can run on any infrastructure, it does not need Google's infrastructure to run. So, what is special about it? So, uh, what is the difference then between these two is that the uh, Cockroach DB will not have the same clock, uh, clock synchronization that Spanner will have because of course, Spanner runs in Google data centers, they have the uh, physical clocks which uh, tend to keep uh, time fairly accurately. So, the key point is uh, what does it give you know for, for practitioners? So, the, the point is um, of course, GB can only do what is called as linearizability uh, whereas, uh, Spanner can actually achieve serializability or, or it is the other way around. So, uh, serializability is the lesser condition which means that it essentially gives the view of the database as if every transaction is operating one after the other. That's serializability. 
linearizability is a harder uh, one which says that in addition to doing that a snapshot read would also be consistent a snapshot read means that just a point in time i go and uh, look at the state of the database it should be consistent in the sense that there should not be uh, you know time stamps which may be inconsistent so that inconsistency will be there in cockroach db and it will not be there in uh, spanner so spanner achieves linearizability which is the harder uh, thing to achieve and cockroach db will only be able to achieve uh, serializability which is okay for most uh, uh, transactions but uh, if you need point of time read of a database yeah, i am going to wrap up in couple of minutes so that becomes very hard to do so uh, and of course the uh, thing is uh, uh, spanner does not violate the cap theorem in any way so cap theorem is inviolable so there's no way it can violate the cap theorem but one key thing is uh, it's uh, uh, people can look at it as a ca system so consistent unavailable because uh, google have made partitions such a rare event because of their infrastructure and so on right so partition becomes a very very rare event so the availability is so high that it can be seen as an effective ca system but in theory right it's a cp system so it tends to trade off availability keep it consistent but sacrifice availability but because of its uh, you know infrastructure and what they've achieved it's an effective ca system so which is significant right ca system in practice at scale is really hard to get but that's what is spanner uh, effective ca system uh, so let me kind of wrap up quickly and uh, uh, so won't go into too much details we don't have much time uh, so tend to talk about uh, yeah formal verification thing i wanted to touch on because uh, one key thing is the ability to verify some of these systems is not so easy so there are uh, work done in the last uh, few years to uh, look into this especially verifying the safety properties of the spirit systems uh, people have done some work so we can look at that and uh, to quickly uh, wrap up right um, so we started from the consensus problem then went a little bit into uh, you know consistency issues acid properties looked at cap theorem what is the significance of cap theorem then we came to the new sql systems of the world so which tend to achieve uh, acid properties uh, you know at scale so uh, spanner is one of the perfect examples spanner has certain unique features because of its ability to synchronize clocks uh, so that does result in a uh, lot of benefits for people uh, and of course formal verification is something we couldn't touch upon during the interest of time but so we can look up uh, slide will be made available uh, if you have time for questions i'll stop right here and wait we have time for questions right okay cool uh you have uh, while talking about tensor flow you have mentioned kernel implementations okay so can you uh, put a little more insight in kernel implementation in case of multiple nodes and multiple clusters when uh, uh, the, suppose when more than multiple clients like python clients are uh, connecting in the network so how the load balancing and query prioritization and object serialization gets place uh we can discuss that often because it's probably uh, i i took tensor flow just to illustrate complexity of the spirit systems but we can talk about that off uh, the shelf because the focus of the talk is more on the spirit systems in general and consensus and so on right so we will discuss that but then uh, the, uh, the the fact that i mentioned that was in the context of the fact that tensor flow tends to do many many things and which makes it very complex to implement and the need for a consensus protocol in such a complex system so that's the context in which i have uh, you know talked about it but we can discuss it offline i don't want to take too much of time on because it's kind of a digression so yeah go ahead hi uh, you had mentioned earlier in your talk that there were some systems which were trading off consistency when they didn't need to could you give an example of any of that uh the uh, uh react for example right uh, tends to say that uh, we sacrifice consistency because cap theorem tells us so and so but even in the face of you know a non partition event partition is a rare event right even in the face of 
you know, even when there is no partition, they tend to sacrifice consistency, which is surprising, right? Which they should not be doing, but they are doing that. So, that is the point I was making that the uh, consistency latency trade off becomes very important in that case, but they are not looking at that. So, I mean, just the point, yeah. Do we have another question? There is time for one more. Question over there. Can someone hand a mic over to the man? Yeah. Uh, so, what is the catch here? I mean, uh, if, if, if these NoSQL systems do scale as good as uh, uh, NoSQL ones and they give all the goodness of the traditional SQL ones, then I mean, basically they will take over, right? They will take over both the other categories. So, what is the catch? I think so. Uh, my view, in fact, uh, I wrote a blog saying that uh, Spanner and you know the advent of the new SQL systems could mean the end of the NoSQL world as we know it. Not just NoSQL, right? Even the traditional SQL one. Uh, the traditional SQL ones, they have their own use cases, right? For example, the you know uh, you have smaller data sets on which you need to run more computation, so you tend to go for that. That's a very specialized kind of system, right? So they might still be there. But the NoSQLs of the world might, you know, they have to be really aware of, you know, what's going on because uh, the fact that Spanner and some of these systems can do asset transactions at scale is significant, and none of the NoSQLs, most NoSQLs, won't be able to do uh, asset. So, so the real point there is uh, uh, NoSQLs explicitly prohibit asset transactions. The new SQLs tend to allow it, but there is of course a penalty to be paid at scale and which they allow. So, that is really the difference, but uh, but you are right, the NoSQLs have to be beware now, yeah. I do not know if I answered your uh, question, but uh, we can talk. There is also a question and answer session today after lunch at 2.40 with all of the speakers from this morning's um, database section. So. If you can hold your questions till then, I think we're about done. Thank right. you very much. Thank you. How are you guys all feeling? Are you having a good morning? Maybe it's not morning anymore. Before we bring on our next session, I would like to make again a couple of announcements. Um, I see some friends up in the balcony. You figured out how to get up there. Congratulations. If we get too full up here, you can use the balcony. It's open. Um, go through the doors in the back and up the stairs. Another reminder to please fill in your feedback forms. You have paper forms that were on your chairs um, that cover all the sessions in book.